So now that we've seen some examples of higher order derivatives, let's see what they can actually be used for. So I have some applications of these higher order derivatives. And the first example that I've picked out is an application to velocity and acceleration. And I've picked this example because this should be the easiest example for you to try and apply it or try to understand it in a real life setting. So here's where we're going to start. If the position of an object moving along a straight line is given by the function s of t, where t stands for time, then we should already know that the first derivative gives us velocity. So we are going to label it v of t to stand for velocity, but we know that we get the velocity equation from the derivative of our original equation, where our original equation is given by s of t. So in notation, it can be s prime of t, or we can also write it as es dt. So again, we know the first derivative already stands for the velocity. But let's see what applications the second derivative has. The second derivative actually gives us the acceleration of our particle, whether it is speeding up or slowing down. So the way that we get acceleration is we take the derivative of the derivative. So we take the derivative of our velocity equation, where it can be written as v prime of t or dv dt. Or we also know this can be represented as the second derivative, s double prime of t or d squared s over dt squared. So here is a first application of why we might ever need to take more than one derivative. So now that I've explained this, let's go ahead and look at an example. If the position of an object moving along a straight line is given by s of t equals our function here, 3t to the fifth minus 5t to the third minus 7, at time t, where time varies between 0 and 4 seconds, then we want to do these three things. We want to figure out the object's velocity and acceleration. We want to figure out all the times in the given interval where the particle is stationary. And we want to find all times t when the acceleration is 0. Now, I have given you all the information that you should be able to answer this on your own. So here is where I suggest that you pause the video. So to figure out the object's velocity equation or to come up with our v of t equation, we know that comes from taking the derivative of our original equation. So we just need to take the derivative of this guy here. It's all in the format of a constant times x to some power, so I just get to apply my four shortcut rules. First, I have 15t to the fourth minus second 15t squared, and then the derivative of my constant is equal to zero. So my velocity equation is equal to this guy here. Then we want to figure out what our acceleration equation was. Well, we know that comes from the derivative of the velocity. Or that comes from the second derivative of our original equation. So basically, we just need to take the derivative of this box answer here. So that gives me 60t cubed minus 60t. Just again, applying my four shortcut differentiation techniques. So that gives me my acceleration equation. So this is an example of where you might take a second derivative in a real life example. Now let's move on to our next couple of parts. In part B, we want to know all times in the given interval when the particle is stationary. Well, if we ever want to know when something is stationary, that means the rate of change is not moving. So if something is stationary, that means our rate of change is not moving, and the numerical value that goes with that is when our rate of change is zero. Now we know another way to say rate of change is our velocity. So basically, we want to know when our velocity equation is zero. 
Well, in the last example, we just figured out that our velocity was equal to 15t to the fourth minus 15t squared. So we want to figure out when that is equivalent to zero. Okay, this is a degree four equation. So we're going to solve it by using our factoring method. We notice that we have common factors of 15t squared. So if we take that out, that leaves us with t squared minus one. I can continue to factor this t squared minus one. It's a difference of squares. So I'm gonna factor that as t plus one and t minus one. So when I set this equal to zero, that means I set all three of my factors equal to zero. In the first one, when I set 15t squared is equal to zero, that's going to give me t equals zero. In the next one, it's going to give me when t is equal to negative one. And the last one is going to give me when t is equal to positive one. So these are all the times in this given equation where my velocity is zero or when my particle is stationary. Well, we have one extra thing to worry about here. Find all the times in the given interval when the particle is stationary. So I only want to know between zero and four seconds when my particle is stationary. Remember, T stands for time. So if I ever have a negative time value, that doesn't make any sense. So this one here, t of negative one, gets thrown away. My other two times, t is equal to zero, fits in my interval, and t equals positive one fits in my interval. So those are both when my particle is stationary, at zero seconds and at one second. So that is my answer to part B. In part C, something very similar. We want to figure out when our acceleration is zero. So we want to take our acceleration equation and set it equal to zero. In the last slide, we figured out that our acceleration was equal to 60t to the third minus 60t. Okay, so we just need to figure out where this is equal to zero. We're gonna solve it using the same method by factoring and we can factor out our common factor. We're gonna take out a 60t and that leaves me with t squared minus one is equal to zero. So factoring it again in the same format, that gives me 60t times t plus one times t minus one. When I set this equal to zero, that gives me when t is equal to zero, when t is equal to negative one, and when t is equal to positive one. Now this one technically says find all times where t is equal to zero. So I officially should box all of these answers, but we know in applications of real life that we cannot have a negative time format. So we actually get the same answers that we did in the first example. Now this is not what typically happens. We should not typically get the same answers for part B and part C, but that's the way it worked out for this example. So here you can see an actual application of why you might need a second derivative if you ever want to use an acceleration equation.